begin by thanking the uh, organizers for the kind invitation and for the academy for the honor. For a boy who grew up right next door to RRI and IIC in Maleshwaram, this is a special honor, so thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about our work which spans about the last 15 years or so, uh, a brief uh, introduction to that work, exploring the intersexual genomic conflict using Drosophila melanogaster as a model system. We all have studied, known, admired Charles Darwin and his idea of uh, natural selection, but he's also the man who came up with the idea of sexual selection in his book in 1871 on the descent of man. Darwin uh, defined sexual selection as the advantage that certain individuals of a particular sex have over the individuals of the same sex in terms of solely reproduction. Um, Typically, when you think of natural selection, the way it is described as advantages or variation in the ability of organisms to survive given a certain environment, whereas sexual selection is more thought of in terms of advantages or va variation between individuals in terms of their reproductive ability. And Darwin also realized that sexual selection can in principle have two different components. You can look at it in two different ways. One is called intersexual selection, the other is called the intrasexual selection. Again, going back uh, in history, typically when people model sexual selection and sexual reproduction, one thinks of one sex investing a lot more into reproduction and typically that happens to be the female and the other sex investing less in reproduction than that happens to be the male. And the sex that invests a lot more into reproduction is the one that gets to do the choosing and the one that invests less is the one that is chosen. So typically if a female chooses a male to mate with, then you have intersexual selection, typically called mate choice. Whereas in other scenarios, the sex that invests less in reproduction, typically the males, they have to compete with each other, let's say in contests or uh, actual physical fights and then gain access to females to mate with. If that is what is happening, then you call it as intrasexual selection. Right? Now this idea of uh, sexual selection has been necessary or at least Darwin thought it was necessary because he thought there were certain traits among animals that were not easily explained using natural selection. If you think of the long tail of the peacock, it should reduce the survival tip of the peacock because it is an easy prey because it carries that long tail, but yet the tail exists. Why? Because Darwin said that it is probably the peahen which chooses the males with really long tails and therefore the tail evolves. Why should the peahen choose the males with the long tail? That's a totally different story. But this is a case of intersexual selection. So this tail which is being elaborated because of the choice of the female is what you call a sexually selected trait. If you think of some other animals like these um, um, these um, deer probably, there the males have to fight with each other and gain access to females. If having large antlers helps you win the contest, then the antlers are expected to increase in size. So the antler becomes a sexually selected trait. But in this case, it is the intrasexual selection that is happening. Now this idea has been worked on, the idea of sexual selection has been worked on empirically, theoretically for more than 100 years or so. And this idea has been expanded upon by the work of Fisher, Bateman, Parker, etc. We have new paradigms, new ways of looking at this whole idea of intersexual coevolution. One of these ideas is that of sexually antagonistic coevolution or simply called intersexual conflict. So, what is this intersexual conflict? Now, Trivers defines this beautifully. He says that look, if the if there is no random mating and lifelong monogamy, then the evolutionary interests of males and females can be different such that males and females can evolve characters that increase their own fitness but at the cost of the fitness of the other sex. A classic example of this is mating rate in uh, species like the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. You can show experimentally in Drosophila melanogaster males will increase their fitness here when I say fitness, Darwinian fitness, think of a proxy as how many offspring it leaves. That's a good proxy of Darwinian fitness. So in Drosophila melanogaster, you can show that the males can increase the number of progeny that they have simply by mating with a large number of females. 
But as a female Drosophila cannot do that. By meeting with a large number of males, she does not increase the uh, number of progeny that she produces. So it is possible for a male to evolve, uh, evolve certain characters which will allow him to have more number of matings. But that particular character that he evolves will reduce the fitness of every single female that he mates with by a little. So the male overall gains, but the females every time lose. Right? So if you have characters that will unequivocally increase the fitness of both the sexes, that will go to fixation in a population. If there are characters that will reduce the fitness of both the sexes, that will be eliminated from the population. It is these characters that can potentially increase the fitness of one sex at the cost of the other sex that will remain in the population for a long time, remain to be resolved, and that is what is called sexual conflict. Right? Now, there are two types of uh, sexual conflict that one recognizes. One is called intralocus sexual conflict. It is because of the expression of the same alleles in the two sexes and these alleles have different effects on the um, fitness of the two sexes. The other is called interlocus sexual conflict, which is a conflict over the optimal outcome of intersexual interactions. And we have worked on both these. Today, I'm going to talk only about this interlocus sexual conflict. How does it work, the interlocus sexual conflict? The model for this was come up by Holland and Rice way back in 1999. It begins with the idea of male-male competition or intrasexual selection. If you have a population where males are competing with each other for access to females, then you can expect that the males will be selected to evolve characters that give them an advantage over other males in terms of getting access to females. So if such characters do evolve, then occasionally it is seen just by chance these characters can cause harm to their mates. They harm the females. So therefore, if such characters do evolve, then the male fitness will go up, but the female fitness will come down. Are there examples of such characters? There are a large number of such characters as examples one could use. The poster child for such studies, Drosophila melanogaster males, during mating transfer a huge cocktail of proteins into the females. It increases the male fitness but reduces the female fitness. There are a large number of mor uh, morphological characters seen in you know, beetles, bed bugs, water striders, snails, large number of morphological characters which have the, uh, the property of increasing male fitness at the cost of female fitness. So there are a large number of such examples. So if such characters do evolve in males, then it is incumbent that females will evolve resistance to such characters. If female resistance to such male-induced harm does evolve, then again, female fitness goes up, male fitness comes down. So now you have males and females locked into this open-ended cycles of adaptation and counter-adaptation. And this is somewhat similar to the Red Queen process that you would see between hosts and parasites or uh, you know, um, prey and predator and so on. Point to note is that how fast this antagonistic coevolution happens can be driven by what is the intensity of male-male competition. If you have a large amount of competition happening, then this coevolution happens faster. If the competition is less, then you would expect this to happen a little less. Okay. So very interesting model, but how does one go about testing it. People have tried various approaches. People have looked at field observations, comparative studies, field manipulative experiments, beautiful studies, but they have been a little difficult to do and a little difficult to interpret because field studies, you don't have control over a large number of factors. So can you do these studies in laboratory in a much more controlled environment? If you do want to do it, what is it that you require? You need a population that has a history of sexual conflict. You should have ample additive genetic variation for the traits to evolve. You should also be able to measure the characters in an environment that is most meaningful to those populations. Right? So we use laboratory adapted populations and we do laboratory studies on such things. So we have populations of Drosophila sitting in our lab under standard well-defined conditions for more than about 600 generations. So that is their home environment now, you expect them to have adapted to that. Everything about them is controlled and constant. We know when natural selection acts on them. We know when sexual selection acts on them. We can even measure the Dar Darwinian fitness of these populations, something that is very difficult to do in the wild. What we did was we simply developed three sets of populations 
from this original population in which we manipulated the levels of sexual conflict. How do you do that? In one set we made the populations male biased. Every three male you had one female. So, you had more males competing for females. So, there is more male male competition. So, greater levels of intersexual conflict as opposed to that you have female biased populations a whole set of them where you have three females for every male. So, less number of males less male male competition. So, less conflict and you also have controls. These populations are in replicates and they have been maintained like this for generation after generation. Now, it is close to 300 generations. So, every generation you reset the uh, sex ratio in these populations. Everything else about these populations is the same. Nothing is different. Uh, only thing that is different between these populations are the sex ratios and they are in the lab. So, whatever evolves I can be sure has evolved because of this manipulation of sexual conflict. So, all that we have done in these populations is we have changed the levels of sexual conflicts in these populations. So, I want to find out what has evolved. The predictions for the males are very clear that the populations which are male bias, male should have become more competitive, should be more harming compared to males from the female bias populations. Is that the case? We have measured a whole lot of characters, uh, courtship frequency, locomotor activity. These are all proxies for male fitness. They are strongly associated with male fitness. You see that in every case, the males from the male bias populations have higher levels of the male fitness associated traits. So, they have evolved. In these populations, there is also something very special called sperm competition. In these populations, male male competition does not end with the male mating with the female. These females mate with multiple males and store sperms from a large number of males. So, these sperms compete with each other to fertilize the eggs. So, being able to win sperm competition is very important. So, we also asked have the male bias males become better at sperm competition and not very surprisingly every single uh, component of sperm competition we can show that the male bias males are much superior to the males from the female bias populations. So, the males have evolved uh, characters that are important for male fitness. Does that mean that they have become more harming? So, do these males have differential mate harming ability? You can look at it in different ways. You take the males from the male bias populations and female bias populations, put them with females and ask what happens to the female mortality and how many progeny they produce. So, you can measure female fitness in two different ways. So, these are results from experiments where common females have been put with males either coming from the male bias populations or the female bias populations. You see females combined with male bias population males die faster. If you look at how many progeny they produce, if the males are from the female bias populations, there is no mate harm. If the males are from the male bias populations, there is a severe drop in fecundity. So, the males have actually become different in terms of their mate harming ability. So, what does this mean in terms of females? Right? You would expect the females from the male bias populations to have become more resistant to mate induced harm compared to females from the female bias population. So, is that the case? You can again look at mate harm in two different ways. Look at the uh, survival ability of the females and how many progeny they produce. So, you took we took uh, females from the female bias populations and male bias populations, exposed them to males and asked how well they survive. Females from the male bias population survive much better. So, they are more resistant to male induced harm. If you look at their progeny production, if you are a female from the male bias population, there is really no harm. If you are a female from the female bias population, then there is a strong drop when you are continuously exposed to male induced harm. So, there is a differentiation in the mate harm resisting ability of the females from these two populations. Right? So, in some sense we have almost completed evidence for this entire model, but for one piece which is this. So, the females have become more resistant, but does that feedback on male fitness? So, what we did was we took females from all these populations and put them with males and asked do the male fitness, does the male fitness now get affected? So, these are females from different populations. This is the longevity of the males or the mortality of the males that have been combined by with females from different populations. What you see is if males were housed with male biased females, they die more 
compared to when housed with females from the female bias population. So, there is a negative effect on the females of interacting with females that are uh, uh, more resistant. Right? So, the males do pay a cost. So, in that sense, we have evidence for the negative effect of female evolution on male fitness also. So, this set of experiments in some sense gives you a comprehensive evidence for this model of interlocus sexual conflict from a single system. Now, this is not just it what we have done, we have now asked okay, given that this evolution is happening, does that affect other traits and we find that there is an effect on a whole range of traits starting from you know life history traits such as the populations which are under long, uh, stronger conflict, they age faster, they die faster, their immunity is lower for example. There is also dif uh, differences between cognition and learning ability, Pop uh, flies from the populations which have greater conflict seem to be intrinsically better at doing certain tasks, for example, identifying females which are receptive. Right? Interestingly, this also drives incipient speciation because you have replicate populations which are isolated from each other and the male female coevolution in each of these populations can be independent. Each of these populations can evolve to be very different such that males and females from the each population will prefer to mate with their own type and not with the other type. So, in the male bias populations we have evidence for speciation but not in the female bias populations. Right? So, to summarize what our work shows is that there is strong empirical evidence for interlocal sexual conflict and conflict affects a large number of traits be it immunity, life history, cognition, everything and more importantly it can also act as an engine of speciation. Okay. So, I would like to stop here with a thanks to our funding agencies. This is where our lab started about this is a photo about 12 years ago. This is where the lab is right now. A uh, special thanks to all the uh, PhD students, postdocs and especially the undergraduate students of Isa Mohali without whom much of this work would not have been possible and thank you all. But I want to get to a temporal dimension of this cycle vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the strength, the numerical strength of each of these populations because genetic drift also would play a role and yes. that would impact on time. Yes. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts yeah. on that? Mm -hmm. So, um, in these seasons, these are experimental populations and we artificially maintain their population numbers constant and large. These are really large populations with at least a thousand flies each. So, in our systems, we find no evidence for uh, genetic drift um, uh, uh, having any uh, effect. You can in fact show that the three populations except for the um, mate choice for most of the characters you can show parallel coevolution. So, that would not uh, that is not what you would see if there was genetic drift. What would happen in natural populations of course, that is a much more difficult question to ask. I do not think there has been enough studies to answer that question. Yeah, that was exactly the question I was coming to. In natural populations, how much male bias and female bias do you actually, do the flies actually experience for right. this process to happen? Right. Um, in the wild populations, you do not get too much of a male bias or female bias, but you can pick up signatures of intersexual conflict. The only thing, the reason that we make our populations male bias, female bias is to drive the process faster so we can see it faster. But all these effects of the negative effect of uh, you know let us say for example, the accessory gland proteins, uh, the, um, the elaboration of certain male traits in not just Drosophila, but in a host of insects, uh, this has all been found in natural populations. In fact, there is a classic set of studies on natural populations of water striders by Arnquist and his colleagues, uh, which shows morphological elaboration of male reproductive traits and female reproductive traits. So, you can pick up signals.
even without male bias and female bias. Um, just um, to ask this, would a general conclusion of such studies be that all the advantages and costs that are paid by the males and the females tend to balance the population and, and stabilize the population? Is that, a, is, can that be arrived by these studies? Um, if it is a general conclusion that one is looking at, then I would say two things. One is that these kinds of studies show that the population mean fitness is far lower than what it can potentially be. That is very clear. The second is if you look at long term fitness of populations, then it hovers at around 1 or slightly less than 1 because if it goes slightly higher, those populations would have actually taken over. So, those are the two general conclusions I would say. Okay, there are several questions I believe. Uh, can you wait for one second? There is one here. You have yeah. yeah. Thanks for the talk, Prasad. So, uh, you say that these uh, uh, sort of like this sexual conflict will lead, will work as a agent for speciation. Do you have any theories as to what properties the new incumbent species will have? No, absolutely none. In fact, the speciation is happening, okay, I think I should say this. What is interesting is typically when you think of speciation, you think of organisms going to different environments, adapting to them and therefore becoming incompatible. Here you have populations sitting in a lab environment in the same incubator yet differentiating. The only reason being that the intricacies of male female coevolution within each population is likely to be different. So, they are going to differentiate. Which route is it going to take? No idea. I, I have a simple question. Yeah. In some of your graphs, especially in the later section, I found the error bars are so high yeah. and still you are trying to draw a conclusion of the uh, graph uh, listing. I knew this, which is why I put uh, the alphabets A, B, C, D. Uh, I do not know whether it is a standard uh, convention or not. At least for us biologists, any two levels that are not connected by the same alphabet are statistically significant. So, these are all after rigorous statistical analysis. So, even though your error bars might look like that, they are statistically significant. Now, why the error bars are so high? Biological systems, uh, highly variable. I wish the, uh, the errors were smaller. They are not. No, my question is simple. My question is the top of one, uh, one of the point like error bar top and the bottom of the another one is almost on a line. Yeah. So, will the conclusion now change? No, I mean in the sense that we are looking at differences for in some cases the means are the medians, right. In most of the graphs that I showed were the means and and most of these analysis are based on analysis of variance. And what I can tell you, even after multiple comparisons and corrections for multiple comparisons, these, compa these differences are significant. Okay. 